Hi, I'm Jeff. This is Tropical Plants, our 53 degrees north. And in today's video, we're going to have a look at genetic mutations in flowers. And I've been able to find some quite interesting mutations in the plants in my greenhouse. Found them by accident, purely by accident. Uh, but after some further research, I've managed to find a few more. Uh, we're going to talk about pyloric blooms and the difference between pyloric blooms and genetic mutations. So let's get started. And we're in. So, first of all, no, we're not looking at the Zygopedalum because we're doing another video on it. We just happen to have here uh, and a good example of a genetic mutation. This is a naturally occurring genetic mutation. Now, can you spot it yet? Now, if you're over on my Instagram, you'll have seen that. If you don't follow me on Instagram, have a look in the description and you can go and find me over there. But quite clearly, you can see a difference between the bloom that we have here that's the normal shaped bloom where we have the two petals there the modified petal underneath or the lip and the three sepals one there one there and one there They're the lateral se sepals and the i think it's the dorsal sepal i'll have to look that up i shall stick a pop up if i've got that wrong and we've got the anther and the cap in the middle there now next to it the latest bloom, the one right at the very end, and scientists think this is something to do with the extra sap that you get at the end of a plant. This happens in foxgloves as well sometimes, that the, the very final bloom on the end is uh, a, a mutated one. Now you can see here, this one has, now it's very difficult to tell whether the petals are sepals, I don't know, because that one is easy to tell because I know where they occur on the plant this one i really don't know that could be a petal that could be a petal but it's not modified whereas you've kind of got parts there where they're fused together and you can see a little bit of the purple there so what's the difference between this and a pyloric bloom well a pyloric bloom is and this is new to me i have to look this up but if i understand it correctly anyway it's to do with the symmetry of a flower so if you have a flower that is normally that normally has radial symmetry so in in a circle as opposed to a flower that has like a bilateral symmetry like an orchid does where you could draw a line right down the middle like a mirror and then you have symmetry on either side it, a pyloric flower is when you get the opposite of that occurring so one that normally has bilateral symmetry suddenly has radial and vice versa um, I believe there's a little bit more to it than that as well. I think you can get extra growths and things on pyloric flowers. I'm sure you'll find some more information if you Google it. But that's pyloric, whereas what we're looking at here is nothing to do with the symmetry. This is to do with a complete genetic mutation. And it just happens naturally for most of the time. I'm not sure mine is happening naturally, but I'll show you some of the others and I'll discuss some of the other reasons that you might get this kind of uh, a mutation okay we're over on one of my streptocarpus plants this is katie now i only noticed this i've not noticed it as it was growing i only noticed it the other day because i thought oh, they're very close together those leaves and i was just kind of trying to move them apart and realized they don't come apart what we have here is a fused together leaf two leaves together, two leaves growing, but the rib is shared. Be careful not to snap it off. You can, you can even see the extra ribs there, but they're all fused together. So you have this kind of a, it's like a, a three-way leaf. Now that is just an ordinary genetic mutation. Now what could have caused it? Well, yes, it could be natural. Mutations occur naturally. That's what evolution is. And when, <clears throat> when mutations occur naturally and it's to the benefit of a particular species, be it plant or animal, then that trait can be passed down simply because that animal will have a better chance of survival if it's of a benefit. Whereas if it's not of a benefit, then that animal or plant will soon perish and that particular genetic mutation will not continue now very often for most the most part these mutations are one-offs 
and it won't happen again. You can prune it out, be it flower or leaf or fruit or whatever part of the plant it is, and you won't see it again on that plant. But sometimes these mutations are stable and they continue down the line. And now what, if that happens, then you might have uh, a cash cow on your hands because if it's a plant anyway, you might be able to offer it to a nursery and they might then breed that stable mutated plant and it might be of benefit to other people. They might prefer it, they might like it, it might be a better bloom or it might have some other characteristic that people uh, feel is better than the original one. Maybe it lasts longer, maybe it grows bigger, maybe the plants have a better fragrance. Who knows, you know, the, this is what makes up a big part of the plant market. So I will show you another Streptocarpus mutation because apparently Streptocarpus are pretty prone to mutations anyway. Okay, now this is the same, actually the same uh, cultivar of Streptocarpus. This is Katie. Now can you spot what I spotted about five minutes ago? Well, we're looking at the one in the center, this one. So normally we have two, four, five petals. This one's only got four. It's a bit like looking for a four leaf clover. And actually, if you've ever done that, there's surprisingly quite a lot. If you, if you look at a, a big patch of ground with clovers on, most have got three, some have got four, some have even got five. I spent many a happy hour as a child looking for four leaf clovers. So there's another mutation. Now, the question is, are these natural mutations? Well, they might be, there's no way of telling, but other causes of these kind of mutations are chemicals. Now, I have used systemic chemicals on pretty much all these plants, and I'm wondering whether my fused together leaf, and maybe this one here, maybe even the Zygopedalum terminal flower is a cause of a, a systemic chemical spray. Now I know for a fact that I sprayed my Brugmansia which is outside at the moment because it was covered in spider mite and the leaves, because they were quite new leaves, began to curl at the edges. Now when I looked that up it appears that that is a thing and that leaf curl on Brugmansia can be caused by systemic pesticides. It makes sense really if you think about it. If you are going to spray some chemical on a plant and expect it to go inside the plant to then kill off any pests, it makes sense that it could then cause a mutation. And many, many plants are actually purposely mutated through the use of chemicals. And a good example here, well actually it's not a good example because it's not a good example of a Venus flytrap, but the one that I've got outside that you see which is really good, <laughs> this is the one that was really slow to come back. It has begun to create some very small traps now but it's, it's it's taking a while but it will come these are divisions so they're not as vigorous as the original plant but the reason i show this one is that there is only one species of dionea recipula and every other species or cultivar sorry that you can see is a mutation of the original so that what they have done is they have applied, even in some cases, radiation, but various chemicals to come up with some stable mutations and then they have bred those stable mutations. So all the many, many cultivars that you can see of Dionea muscipula, Venus flytrap, are actually mutations. And here's another one that I found. So this is a Pelagonium, an angel Pelagonium, SK Verglo. And you can see what the blooms are supposed to look like. And over here we have one with hardly any on it. Just the kind of vein pink on there. And I'm not, I've not sprayed this one. So maybe this was sprayed in wherever I bought it from. And maybe it's just a natural mutation. Interesting to look actually if you've got any in your own collection. I've never really looked for them before until now. And then I'm spotting them all over the place. Another one to think about and to look at is Tredescantia. Now this one is Tredescantia tricolor minima and it's got all these different types of leaves on it. You know, the, the variegated ones, the 
like ver various variegations on the different leaves. We've got cream, we've got mainly green, we've got mainly cream, we've got some that's just cream and nothing else. And you find that the green, just pure green, tend to be the ones that are more vigorous. So that is a natural, usually anyway, mutation. And very often, I mean, I think people are, are well, especially gardeners, are well familiar with the variegated plants and shrubs we've got in our gardens that tend to revert back to the greener original. And if you cut those greener ones out, because obviously they probably photosynthesize more efficiently than the variegated leaves. So if you cut those out, then you, you will find that your plant will maintain that variegation. Whereas if you leave it, then you will find that the, the green one will tend to take, take over. So it's actually all around us. It's not just the, the one-off. You know, it can be a bit of a shock to see a one-off uh, leaf or bloom that looks completely different. But as I say, if you find that that stays like that and, you know, the rest of the plant stays like that, then you might have uh, a, a good top seller on your hands, a best seller on your hands. So it's worth having a look at. OK, finally, this pathetic specimen of a streptocarpus. That is not what the flower is supposed to look like. So this one is a crystal ice and it should, let's move over here, it should look like that but it's gone very, very small and it's just not formed properly. So that's certainly not a mutation that I particularly like and I might cut that spike off and see if the next spike is any better, whether it's just a, a one-off. Which brings me to some other causes of mutation. So insects, insect damage itself can cause mutations. So if you have an infestation of spider mite, or in my case, a lot of these streps had a cyclamen mite on them, and that caused mutations to the leaves, mutations to the blooms. And uh, one more thing is the temperatures. If you've got temperatures that they're not normally used to, for example, in my particular case, I'm in a greenhouse, so I have very, very high fluctuations in temperatures. It can be 30 degrees Celsius one minute, and then, you know, the clouds can come over and overnight it can drop to, well, it did drop to about seven degrees Celsius, but I have kept it to about 12 for the last few months. So that can also cause mutation. So it is a natural thing for the most part, but I think for those of us who are growing indoors, it's worth remembering that our casual dispensation of chemicals can also cause a problem. Although it may cause, you know, our pension for us, it may result in uh, a nice sport, which is another term for it, that is something that we might be able to sell on to a nursery or a, another plant seller who will then breed it. So I'll just leave you on this absolutely gorgeous regal pelagonium here. Um, hope that was interesting for people. So that's pyloric flowers and mutations and some of the causes of mutations and some of the ones that I've got in my greenhouse, which I have only very recently notice so i'll now keep an eye out for those so if you enjoyed it and you thought it was useful give me a thumbs up i'd like to hear it. not your personal ones on your plants and um, if you've got any stick them in the comments and for now i'll see you on the next one bye <laughs>